uh, and a lot of really positive stuff. I'm excited to be starting this new series entitled Friendology, the, f- the, s- the, the study of friendship. We, in the church, we oftentimes, uh, we, we do a lot of theology, the study of who God is. Uh, we'll do liturgical theology, the study of the liturgy. We look at church history. Uh, we look at dogma, doctrine, the sacraments, all of these different aspects that are so important and critical to who we are as, as people, created in the image of God, intended to commune with God, and to have fellowship with Him. But I thought it was important to also speak about friendship or friendology because who we are is also shaped very much by the people and the things that we befriend. Um, and so maybe we don't realize it, but friendship is probably one of the most impactful things that we experience in life, one of the most impactful um, uh, aspects of our life. We need it, we want it, unless if we've been burned by it, and then we pretend like we don't care about it, but deep down inside, we know it's something that we are longing for. I will tell you myself, I've always known that friendship has been important. Ever since I was young, uh, building and developing friendships was something that was really like, valuable to me. And, and perhaps I, I can confess that there were different times in life where I, I valued friends or friendships more than I should have, certain friendships, uh, that I just kind of, you know, just wanted friendships because I thought it was really what was going to make me feel better. Uh, but maybe it wasn't until later that I understood why and how uh, friendship shapes me. And, um, and I'll just share, like, one of, one of, like, when we're younger, sometimes we look at friendship as this, like, this thing that just makes us feel good, right? When I had just uh, left Detroit, and actually friendship when moving, um, it's such an important thing. It's such a critical thing that we need. A lot of us, we've grown up in the same place or been in a certain place for 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, I will tell you, in my own life, I moved around quite a bit. Uh, it wasn't until um, I think I was in this move, actually, uh, that I have been in the same house for, this is the longest I've ever been in the same house, eight and a half years. Before that, I moved quite a bit. And you could imagine how much that affected the ability to develop and maintain and hold on to friendships. Uh, But it was always something that was important to me. When I was five years old, we had just moved from Detroit. This was my first move. And I remember it like it was yesterday. We're still unloading the truck. And, um, And I go outside and find the kids playing out in the the neighborhood, and I brought in about nine or ten kids into my house, and I said, Mom, Dad, these are my new friends. And by the way, they're coming to my birthday party on Saturday. And my parents were like, birthday party? And they start speaking in Arabic, they're like, birthday party? What birthday party? Like, we didn't know it was going to be a birthday party, right? But I was like, you know, if you want to make friends, you got to throw a party. And so we threw a party, it was a good time, got pizza and had a good time, and developed some friendships. It's something that we long for, whether we're five years old, or we're 50 years old, or we're 90 years old. Like, it's something that we desire, that we want, that we need. This series, we're going to be talking today about why friendship. Next week, healthy friendships. Week three is unfriending. Sometimes there's friendships that we've got to walk away from. What does that look like? Why and how? To do that, number four, week four, we're going to be talking about being a friend of God. We're going to be looking specifically at James chapter two, where it describes Abraham as a friend of God. And number four, five is going to be pointing at the church as being a friendly community of friends. And what that does for the, the life of the church and for people when they enter into the church. And what does that do for us as people who are ministering for and to God and to one another? Friendships today, I will tell you, are declining. And there's so many different reasons why they are. Uh, we work more hours. Um, the way we work is different. Right? Even when we are done with work, we're still working. Um, 
rising divorce, rate, uh, divorce rates are impacting friendships because when a couple splits up, usually it affects at least some friendships, if not the whole circle. The explosion of social media is redefining the meaning of friend and how we view others as friend. We are and have become obsessed with controlling the perception of others. How do others view us and see us? And everything has to be perfect and pretty in the social media world. The friend in the social media world is the one who likes what I say and who follows me. Other reasons why friendships are declining is changing interests and losing the desire to work on friendships because, quite honestly, it, <laughs> it takes work. Friendship is hard. There's a, a documentary that admittedly I have not seen, but I've, I've read through the, the abstract on it or the, the arc on it, and it basically, it's called the, uh, the Age of Loneliness. And it talks about how consumerism has also impacted uh, friendship because we tend to just want to consume, consume, consume. And, uh, and that has even spilled over into our friendships. Loneliness is slowly killing us. The decline of friendship is causing people to kind of just fall into these uh, shells within themselves, and it's killing us, friends. It really is. Loneliness is not just proverbially, it is literally killing us. According to Dr. Murphy, he was a former U.S. Surgeon General, he, says, he describes, he says, loneliness is becoming an epidemic public health crisis in America. He wrote in a 2017 Harvard Business Review article, he says the following, the reduction in lifespan contributed to loneliness is similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and it's greater than the impact of obesity on an individual's lifespan. Let that, let that sink in. Let that sink in. Loneliness is impacting people as much as smoking more than half a pack a day. Or obesity, which we know with, with COVID, the comorbidity of, of that, how it has affected so many people's lives and taken so many people's lives. But this is back in 2017. COVID has simply accelerated this crisis. Uh, it doesn't discriminate by age, race, or creed. I will tell you, my own grandmother just turned 94 in October. Don't tell her I told you her age. If you meet her, but I will tell you that I have seen the impact of being alone on her. Um, for sure, family visits her, but her inability to interact with her, her friends in the building has really affected her psyche and how she, her own, her total health. And she's not alone. Um, it doesn't just, I hear so many people talking about how this affects our young people, our youth. But if we're to be honest, loneliness affects each and every one of us in different ways at different stages of life. Many people point to COVID and its effect on friendships. Even though before COVID, that epidemic was already affecting us here in the U.S. It's uh, friendship... <laughs> is an area that many adults, they don't do well in. And part of the challenge, I think, is as we get older, we have a more difficult time adjusting and adapting. The American Sociological Review indicated a statistic that was alarming. An average American has only two close friends. And 25% of Americans say they have no friends. Let that sink in. 2018, there was a, a, a study done by Cigna, the insurance company, and according to the statistics, about one in two people report being lonely at any given time. One in four rarely or never feel they're understood by others. Imagine that, like never being understood, heard by another person, or feeling like that at least. 
Two in five or 40% sometimes or always feel their relationships are not meaningful. It's just surface. They're not deeply connecting with people. One in five rarely or never feel close to people. Half have meaningful daily in-person social interactions. So imagine, like, if we take half of the church, half of those of us who are here, half of us are at a point where we probably feel like we don't have a meaningful social interaction each day. And Gen Z, take it for what you will, is described as being the loneliest generation. Many adults don't know how to do the friend thing. And gentlemen, let me just share that I think we have our own set of struggles with this as well. Many men admit that they don't have many, if any, good friends, and oftentimes admit to being lonely in surveys. They won't say it out loud, but when you look at surveys, it's there. Being a good friend is, a, is important as followers of Christ. It requires hard work. It requires humility, sacrifice, love, and the C word, commitment. But friendship's important. It is critical for us. And it's indicative to me that it's important to you because we have more people here for this series right now than we have in any series in the last 12 months, perhaps let alone the uh, Lord of the Rings series that we've done. It is such an important series and topic for us. I was recently at a retreat this last year and several of the youth and even one of the members of the clergy opened and confided how they were lonely. Friendship, let's talk about what friendship is and how the scripture defines it. So we know what the epidemic is, we know what the issue is, we know what the, the challenge is, the crisis is, if you will. So let's look at what friendship is. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Proverbs 17, 17, and this is a really important verse about friendship. It's an easy one to remember, Proverbs 17, 17. You can know it, memorize it, and hopefully embrace it and live it. A friend is described here as someone who loves at all times. A friend loves at all times. And then it goes on and says, a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. First time I read this, first several times I read this, I thought, okay, a friend loves, and siblings fight. But that's not what this is saying. Okay? This is saying a friend loves at all times, through thick and thin. They're not a fair-weather friend. You've heard that, that's saying a fair-weather friend. Fair-weather friend is a friend who they are around when things are pleasant, when the weather is good. But a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for adversity. In other words, when there's conflict, that friend is knit to you like a sibling. There are people that we fight with or that we've disagreed with, friends that we've fought with, right? That we've had conflict with. And, you know, what happens is you're just like, ah, moving on. But we can't do that with our siblings, can we? I mean, some of you are like, well, no, no, we can't. We don't do that with our siblings. And what the scripture is telling us here is a friend loves at all times and a brother, one who you consider this friend who you consider like a brother or sister, they're going to be there even when there's conflict. Conflict between you, you work through it. Conflict in your life, they don't walk away. That is what a friend is. They are always there. When there's an issue that happens, you're not worried they're going to drop and run. If you have a disagreement, you feel comfortable sharing that disagreement and sharing where you stand in your perspective. There is safety that's there. There is trust that's there. And a lot of friends are kind of like walking on eggshells because they don't know how the other person's going to react. I'll tell you, every two to four years, this comes up whenever there's an election. I can't tell you how many people I've, I've heard from. It's so sad. I've lost friends over the last X number of months or years because I voted differently. 
or because I had a different political position. How heartbreaking. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. That is how the scripture defines friendship. I want to give you this morning four reasons why friendship is important, according to the scripture. Number one is friendship is important because it reflects our design. If you have your Bibles, again, open to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Friendship reflects our design. It reflects how God made us. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, all the way the very first chapter of the Bible. God creates us in His own image. In the image of God, He created Him male and female. He created them. When it says here that we're created in the image of God, we usually think of we're created in the image that we look like Jesus. But one of the ways that the fathers describe this is that when it says that we're created in the image of God, we're created in the image of the Holy Trinity. And one of the dimensions there of the Trinity is there's an interwoven intimacy between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There are three eternally distinct hypostases or persons, but they are eternally interwoven and one, towards one another. This is how we are designed to be in community, in fellowship, in intimacy with others. We understand the concept of physical intimacy in marriage, but what Scripture is also telling us here is that there is the social and emotional intimacy and spiritual intimacy that we enter into that is pure and holy, but that reflects the image of who we are as image bearers made in God's image. We are social beings. We need relationship. Turn to the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Do you remember? Do you realize this is the first time God says something's not good? It's not good that man should be alone. He created each day. It is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. He gets to Adam, it is very good. Then he looks at Adam alone, it's not good that he's alone. <laughs> we are created to be in community with others. Okay? Number two, friendship is important because it shapes us. I want you to think about your closest friends outside of your family. No cheating. Hopefully, you know, you think your spouse, your children, your parents, etc. Okay, Out, your cousins. Okay, outside of your family. Think of your closest friends. Think of who those people are. And maybe there are people that you, today you don't feel so close to, but they were people that you were once like really close with. Now I want you to think on another level. Think about things that you align yourself with. Maybe they're not people. Maybe we've made ourselves friends to our work to money, to success. And I want to encourage you, do this exercise later. Think of your five closest friends, things that you love at all times, and that, or people that you love at all times, and someone that even when things get difficult, you're like, I'm not turning my back on my job, for instance, or on whatever it may be. Someone back there is pointing at me, I love you too, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, the feeling's mutual. We become shaped by our closest friends. We do. We become shaped by that which we spend the most time with. Right? Proverbs 13, verse 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise. Because like begets like. And when I'm around wise people, I pick up on their wiseness or wisdom. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. I am shaped by my surroundings, like it or not. When we're young, we heard this all the time in Sunday school, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil company corrupts good character or good habits, right? We are shaped by our surroundings. And that doesn't change, by the way, as we get older. It doesn't. Sometimes we ignore it. Sometimes we're like, oh, no, I'm fine. Man, I'm good, right? No, I'm fine. I'm mature, but we are shaped by the things that we befriend. 
could be our entertainment that's shaping us. It could be our values that shape us. But we are shaped by that. One of the beautiful friendships in Christian history is the, the friendship of St. Basil and St. Gregory uh, of Nazianzus, or the theologian. Such a beautiful friendship that you find there. And then they extended their friendship uh, to St. John Chrysostom, which was really wonderful. Isn't it really interesting that you, we, we hear these names? They didn't happen in isolation. They didn't happen in a vacuum. Like, St. Basil doesn't exist by himself. Neither was St. Gregory the theologian. I mean, imagine that's your title, the theologian. Pretty neat. He doesn't happen in isolation. St. John Chrysostom, the golden mouth, doesn't happen by himself. These friends shaped one another. James chapter 4, verse 4. I'm intentionally not putting the scripture up there, the verse, the reference, because I want you to bring your Bibles, because I want you to develop a friendship with the scripture, okay? So I'm not just being lazy. I'm doing that to encourage and, and teach and guide, okay? James chapter 4, verse 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? I cannot befriend the world. Now, I'm not, he's not, we're not talking here, James is not talking here about the earth, the globe, he's talking about the system of the world, right? The, 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 the popular dominant culture that sets itself against the values of the kingdom of God. Do you, know, do you not know that if you befriend the world, that system, it puts you at enmity with, with God? Why? Because the values will be shaped and they're against one another. Who therefore ever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Again, friendship shapes us and it reflects our loyalties. It points to us. It impacts us. One of the most famous friendships in the Bible was David and Jonathan. It is given as one of like, the most beautiful depictions of such friendships that each of us, I think, would strive for. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 3 to 4. David took an oath again and said, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. So Jonathan said to David, Whatever, yourself, whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. Wow. Jonathan, who was supposed to be, by genealogy, the next king, says, this guy is my friend. I'm willing that I might decrease, that he might increase. Because he believed and knew that this guy was anointed by God. Number three, friendship is important because on most occasions, two are better than one. And I'm saying most occasions because we're going to talk about unfriending in a couple weeks and unhealthy relationships, and sometimes two are not better than one. And what does that look like and mean? But for the sake of today, two are better than one in most occasions, okay? Listen to a few statements written down over the years. No man is an island all by himself. Two heads are better than one. There was an old Jewish rabbi who put it this way. Hand cleans hands, fingers clean fingers. Okay? Two are better than one. Try cleaning your hand with only one hand. It's very difficult. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. I'll put this one up for you guys. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls for he has no one to help him. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Ecclesiastes tells us five things here, okay? Number one, 
They have a good reward for their labor. In other words, friendship helps us oftentimes with accomplishments. More work or quality of work is accomplished in a better way when friends come together. The sum will be greater than the parts. And that's the way teams are oftentimes described. A good team, the sum are better than the parts. Number two that it tells us here, the second part, is that we are safer when we're not alone, in the midst of difficulties. When my mother fell earlier this year, um, or earlier last year, she fell on April 3rd, broke her leg, and uh, if you guys remember, like, dad was not able, like, she was caring for dad because of his, his health condition at the time. And, uh, and so he couldn't do anything, and she found herself all alone. I mean, thank God today she had her eye watch, and she could, you know, call my brother real quick, call my, right? She was able to do that. But imagine falling alone, in, and, you know, we're in the age of technology, right? And so, oh, I'll just lean on technology, but that doesn't always fully pick up the gaps. There are some people who literally say, I just want to be in a relationship as I get older. I want to be married as I get older because I don't want to be alone. Like, what if I fall? What if something happens, right? So that's number two. Number three is, it says here, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? This is talking about body heat. Body heat. I mean, they didn't have furnaces and heaters and stuff like that like we do today. But it was about bringing warmth to each other. It's about comfort. Friendship is important because two are better than one. We can comfort one another. Second Corinthians 1 tells us that we can comfort one another with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted. Number four, two are better than one for safety reasons. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand. We can watch each other's back. We can keep each other safe. And number five, the fifth point there, it says a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The third cord is God himself. We keep the relationships and friendships godly. Two are better than one when God remains in the midst. And that's what we heard, by the way, about marriage. When Moore and I were getting ready to get married, we said keep Christ between you and if Christ is between you, the two of your marriage will remain, it'll be strong. I want to tell you, Scripture is telling us the same thing about friendship. If we keep God in our midst, that intertwined presence of God will give real power to the friendship. As we pick up with this next week, we're going to be speaking about healthy relationships. And I'll just briefly mention the fourth reason why friendship is important because friendship provides us opportunity to exchange love. It gives us that opportunity to be image bearers and to share love with others. And that's what we're going to pick up next time. All glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's pray.